Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank Maxime for organizing this, uh, this day, which is very interesting. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to talk about a project which we're, we've been working on for uh, a little bit of time. Oh, sorry. Sorry about the computer thing here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we've been working on trying to understand the Gayoto Moore Naitsky uh, uh, considerations, at least some of them, uh, with Ludmil Katsarkov, Alexander Null, and Panov Pandit, uh, as well as other people in Vienna. Um, so it's a pleasure to be able to speak here about this. Uh, okay. okay, so we wanted to understand the spectral networks of Gayoto Moore Naitsky. From, from the perspective of Euclidean buildings. So this is what we'll be seeing today. Um, and the idea is that this should generalize the trees which show up in the SL2 case. So and, uh, luckily for me, I, I, I didn't actually include any discussion of the SL2 case, but luckily for me, we've discussed the SL2 case uh, considerably already this morning. And uh, well, we, this was maybe not emphasized, but what you can see is that uh, in the SL2 case, we're talking about a foliation defined by the real part of the one form. Uh, and when you have a foliation, that corresponds to a, a tree, which is the space of leaves of the foliation. Okay. So uh, now, the maybe the more somewhat more long-term goal, but this is not really my zone of expertise, is to understand a relationship, uh, as was being discussed, between uh, the the picture of spectral networks and the space moduli spaces of stability conditions. Um, in particular, in the case of spectral networks, there, uh, uh, an important role is played by these transformations where, uh, where there's some jump between the, in, in the topology of the spectral network. Um, and in the case of SL2, uh, one way of thinking of that is that uh, the space of the tree, which is the space of leaves of the foliation, has, uh, undergoes a mutation when, the, when you cross over a BPS state. So, uh, so we'd like to thank Maxime and also uh, another student in Vienna, Fabian Haydn, for important conversations about this. Uh, let's see. So uh, I, I, just, I, don't, I don't have any pictures in the first part of the, the file here, but um, then we'll do, I have some other files with some pictures. So this is first just general. Okay, so, uh, so let's take a Riemann surface X, a vector bundle, uh, assume it has determinant one, and we take a Higgs field, uh, I should maybe apologize that my round fee is what Andy's non-round fee was, and my my the non-round fee will become a, a, a the, the, the round fee will become a non-round fee. But anyway, um, so, so okay, so let's take a, a endomorphism valued one form, uh, and let let sigma be the spectral curve, okay? and we'll be assuming that that's reduced here. Okay, so we have a tautological form. And we just think of that as a multi-value differential form on X. Okay? So we can write locally phi is phi1 up to phi r, uh, and the trace condition, trace equals 0, the determinant 0 for the connection, or trace 0 for the Higgs field uh, condition says the sum of these guys equals 0. Uh, and the, the condition that the, the spectral curve is reduced is the same as saying that the phi i should be distinct for general points in X. Sorry about the size of this. I, I, was, uh, I didn't know you could do the full screen thing. Um, so let's just uh, consider the, the divisor, which is the locus over which the spectral curve is branched. And let's let uh, x star be the complement. So the phi are locally well defined on x star. The spectral curve is, a, is an atoll covering of x star. Okay. So now we'd like to think of two WKB problems associated with this data. Um, the first is the Riemann-Hilbert or complex WKB problem. So let's just take a, a base connection nabla zero on E, assume that that exists, and look at um, a connection nabla T, which is nabla zero plus T times the Higgs field phi. And T is supposed to be a large parameter, so T is one over H bar here, basically. Uh, okay. uh, so then we get a monoromy representation for the connection. And let's also choose a fixed metric on the bundle E. So in this uh, setup, we're just fixing a single bundle E. Okay. Uh, so I mean, I, th I think Andy and Maxime were actually discussing a situation which is more, more general in which the bundle E could also vary as a function of T. And in fact, even the curve and so on could vary as a function of T. Uh, 
right? Now we get a flat structure which depends on t given by the flat connection. Um, so if we transport, so if we take, but now we've got a single bundle which doesn't depend on t, and we've fixed a single metric on this bundle, but now we have a transport function which transports back to the base point. Okay, depending of course on a path. That's why x tilde is the universal cover of x. Um, so if we transport the metric <coughs> by the flat transport back to the base point, then we get a metric on the fixed uh, base, uh, on the fixed, uh, the fiber of the bundle E over the base point. Uh, maybe I should say, we're fixing a trivialization here, E x zero uh, C to the R. Um, and we can think of this as a map to the space of metrics, which is this symmetric space, SLRC modulo SUR. So we get a map from HT from X tilde into uh, the symmetric space, and it's rho T equivariant. So this is not necessarily a harmonic map, but it's supposed to be model, it's supposed to make you think of a harmonic map, basically, uh, as in Hitchin theory, as we'll see on the next page. Um, and so for the complex WKB problem, we'd like to understand the asymptotic behavior of the, of the representation rho t and ht, or just the transport matrix itself, as a function of t going to infinity. So let's define things this way. So let's take two points in the universal cover. Since we've taken two points in the universal cover, there's a unique path going from one to the other. Let's let t p q of t be from the fiber of e over the point p to the fiber over q be the transport matrix. Now let's define the WKB exponent to be the limb soup of one over T of the log of the norm of the transport matrix. Okay, so the norm being the operator norm with respect to the, our fixed metric. So this is supposed to be basically the highest eigenvalue of the transport matrix, which is to say, uh, well, roughly speaking. This is roughly speaking the biggest term of this matrix. Okay. And the, our exponent is just this lambda one. Okay. Now the, the other type of problem, so actually, you know, this, uh, I think now, now that I heard Andy's talk, I, I realized that we had a slight misconception about what you guys were doing. You guys are actually looking at a holomorphic family of uh, of connections depending on your parameter, which you're calling zeta, uh, which, uh, which go to infinity, in fact, for zeta equals zero and zeta equals infinity, um, which are not actually exactly the same as this guy. Uh, but anyway, we can do what we said here too. Uh, but this is, so this is not actually exactly what you guys are doing. In fact, what you guys are doing, I guess, is more, a little bit more closer to the, to the complex WKB question. Uh, because he, what, what's going on here will not depend uh, holomorphically on the parameter t this time. But anyway, so we can still do this anyway. Uh, so, so suppose that we have a stable Higgs bundle, then we solve the Hitchin equation. So we have the Hitchin Hermitian Yang Mills metric on this Higgs bundle, depending where, where we've multiplied phi by the number t, which is a large real number. And let's take the associated flat connection and take the associated representation, okay? In this case, we have a family of actually harmonic maps from the universal cover into the symmetric space. So these are the maps given by the solution of the Hitchin equation. And so one could also ask uh, to understand the asymptotics of the solution of the Hitchin equation in, in this sense. Um, so we can define the transport and the, and the exponent and so on. But here we're using this metric, which, is, which it also depends on t uh, to measure the size. I don't actually have a theorem about that for the moment anyway, but anyway. Okay, so now Gaiotto Mornitsky explained that the, that the exponent nu pq should vary as a function of p and q in a way, so p and q are points on, on x or on x tilde, uh, in a way which depend, is dictated by the spectral networks, okay? Um, so l uh, let me maybe make a pause here to say, you know, what does this basically say so, I'd like to just give the following example. Let's do this like that. 
So Guyot and Martinitsky say it, first of all, so this is kind of uh, classical, that if we go from a point here, for example, to a point here, okay, so, so this, is, this is my picture of, uh, of the spectral network, okay? So these guys are the imaginary foliations labeled something like one, two, maybe. Uh, I'll probably mess up the labeling, but the, this is S an SL3 case. So there's labeling uh, one, two, and two, three, okay? And then we get some collision lines here. If we go from the point P to the point Q, then, uh, then the prescription basically just says that uh, as we cross from here, it, once we've crossed the second one of these imaginary spectral network lines, then we can no longer calculate the transport from here to here as just a simple integral of one of these forms from P to Q. There's a jump happening here. And the collision phenomenon is the same thing. Let's call this. Uh, the collision phenomenon says that the same thing happens, but it's a little bit more subtle here. So if we try to integrate from the point P to the point Q, then we can say, OK, what's the, uh, what is the transport matrix going to look like when we go from the point P to the point Q? OK, what happened here was that uh, if we draw sort of the if we draw the foliation lines, those look like that. And here we sort of clearly went over a mountain pass and then back down again. Okay. And when you go over something and then back down again, then you have to count the back down again uh, negatively, basically. So for example, here you'd have to integrate uh, phi1 up to here and then phi2 here, or something like that. Now if you look at the point P and the point Q, then we haven't actually, we, uh, for example, here, we went o over this mount into the upper part of this mountain pass, but we didn't actually go out of it because uh, we got over to here. And similarly, in, for this guy, P is already inside the, the upper part of the, the mountain pass here, and then it goes down to the point Q. However, uh, so what Gaiotto and Mornitsky say, which is somewhat more, uh, you might say, unexpected in this case, is that actually you have to take into account these collision lines. And since we went over a collision line and then back over a, the conjugate collision line, that you cannot actually calculate the transport from P to Q as just a simple integral of one of the forms from P to the Q. Whereas you would be able to from here to here or from here to here. OK, so, so that's a, a, just a brief, roughly speaking, uh, a rough uh, explanation of what I mean by dictated, the word dictated in here. Now, uh, here's a remark. So we, uh, this was what uh, Maxime was discussing. Uh, in the complex WKB case, we can actually view this transport function in terms of uh, resurgent functions. And to that, we take the Laplace transform. So the Laplace transform is the integral from 0 to infinity of the function of t times e to the minus zeta t. Also, I'm again sorry because I, my parameter zeta here is uh, zeta is not the, the Andy zeta. t here is Andy zeta, but anyway. Um, so here we have a homomorphic function defined for, for large values of zeta. And it admits an analytic continuation with infinite but locally finite branching. Okay. Uh, however, <laughs> that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we can uh, well, well, let me just say, we can describe the possible locations of the branch points. And it turns out, as far as I can tell, at least this, con this, this description is roughly speaking compatible with what Gaiota, Marnitsky, and Say. And I think it's relatively precisely compatible in the sense that I think we can show that, uh, that we get exactly the integrals from points lying over P to points lying over Q along the spectral curve. Um, of course, the question is, you know, if, if which actual integral you get. And uh, so I don't have a, a way of saying that in, in general. Um, it's not the big difference that they have T and the 1 over T at the same time inside the connection. Uh, that's a slight difference, but I don't think it makes too much difference. Uh, so I, uh, I think we can deal with a 1 over t in the, in the perturbed. It essentially comes down to putting a 1 over t in the perturbed piece of the, uh, of the connection. Uh, but anyway, that's not what I want to talk about today. Uh,
uh, yeah. Today we'll look in a different direction. Okay. So uh, in particular, so uh, I mean, one question is, you know, why is it this particular thing, for example, integrate phi one up to here and then phi two to here, or here we integrate something like phi one up to here and then phi three to, to here or something like that. Um, why do you get this particular value of the exponent instead of some other one? Um, and so, uh, so we would like to look at that in terms of harmonic maps to buildings. Um, let me also give a sort of a first look as to why why buildings might be involved. Well, uh, among other things, uh, you could really see what was happening in terms of the 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 harmonic map to the tree in the case of SL2. So that already suggested that buildings would be involved. But we can draw a picture, we can draw the following picture. Uh, of this, uh, the, the, our first, the first thing I said there, going from P1 to Q1, by going over a mountain pass. Okay, so let's draw just this, the lower part of the function. Let's draw that uh, like this. So here's our mountain pass, okay? And say we, we had a point P on the front sheet and the point Q on the other, on the back sheet. And let's suppose that the other differential, the two, three differential, is roughly speaking constant between the point P and the point Q. Okay? Now if we don't want to vary the, the two, three differential too much, our curve in principle shouldn't really vary too much from, from a straight line joining P to Q. So in terms of the, and so this will be the function, the one, two function, the real part. The total variation of the function one, two along this path is actually sort of too big. It's not what we get from the prediction. However, the prediction tells us that what we should actually do is go up to this point here and then back to here. That that's the exponent that you get from the point P to the point Q. And we can see that that's what you get by looking at the distance in the building. So we map the, the Riemann surface to this building, which is just uh, a three-legged tree thing across uh, an interval. The distance from one point to the other in the building, so the point P, uh, that whole part goes to the front sheet, and that whole part goes to the back sheet. Okay, so they're not on the same sheet of the tree, of the building. Okay, to go from one to the other, we just have to go up to here and then back. So this picture was sort of a basic picture, which coincided with the, the prediction that you get. Just in the simple case where we we're not looking at collisions or anything yet. And so our goal with, uh, with the people in Vienna was to try to understand what's going on with the conjecture that, in fact, uh, our, our WKB exponent is actually going to be the distance in the building between the two points. Um, that's going to explain the sort of cancellation phenomenon. If you sort of try to integrate the differential equation by little pieces from P to Q, you're going to get a much bigger answer than the correct answer. And the cancellation phenomenon, oh, sorry, did I turn that off? The cancellation phenomenon says that a lot of those pieces cancel out, and the real exponent is just integrating up to here and back. But which building, because in dimensional algebra is a kind of essentially one lock at a tree, so very few. In higher dimension, there are many. So that, that's the subject of the talk. <laughs> uh, right. Okay, so here's, the, so here's the basic idea. So th this is a wrong basic idea. I mean, uh, I, at least uh, I don't know how to make it correct, basic idea, but uh, it's the basic idea. So the idea is, so let's look at the field of functions, of germs of functions on R, uh, germs at infinity of functions on R. Let's sort of a, suppose that we could define a valuation given by the sort of exponential growth rate of the function. Okay. Then our family of monodromy representations constitutes a map from pi 1x x0 into SLR of the field k. So if I want to act on the Bruat-Titz building, 
And we could just try to choose an equivariant harmonic map from the universal cover into the broad tits building uh, following a uh, Gromov shun. Okay. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem clear how to make this precise uh, because of the fact that uh, we can't really define a field of functions because uh, if you take a function like sine of, sine of x, uh, that's supposed to have exponential growth rate equal to uh, exponent equal to zero. It's supposed to have a growth rate constant. However, of course, if you take one over a cosine of x, it's got lots of poles, so uh, you can't really say that it has a bounded growth rate. So, so uh, at least to me, at least, it doesn't seem clear how to make this precise. Okay. But that's kind of the idea. So luckily, it turns out that An An Pao has actually developed exactly this type of a theory uh, based on work of Kleiner and Lieb. So it turns out that we can just apply their work, basically. Um, maybe some slight modifications are necessary, of course. Um, so the idea is to look at our maps HT as being maps into a symmetric space, but let's rescale the distance on the symmetric space by dividing by T. Okay. Then let's take the Gromov limit of the symmetric spaces with their rescaled distances. That just means take the symmetric space and sort of look at it from really far away. Okay. Of course, it's, it's sort of, since it's kind of infinitely big, even if we look at it from far away, it's still infinitely big. And as we take the sort of the limit of that, you get exactly the, some kind of building modeled on the SLR, Brouillard Hitz building. Then a Brouillard Hitz, an R building, yeah. You get a building. Uh, R building, yeah. It's an R building, yeah. Or even worse, perhaps. I mean, it's some kind of building. Uh, and the limit. Is it clear that it makes sense for R building to have harmonic maps? I mean, you have infinite modification. So. Well, uh, we don't actually need the definition of, I mean, we'll have a definition here, but which will be concrete, so uh, we don't need to worry about that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, so their construction depends on the choice of an ultra filter. I don't even know what an ultra filter is, but uh, <laughs> should, should one day I hope to know what one is. But in any case, uh, it, uh, roughly speaking, it means uh, choose a sort of compatible sequence of choices of subsequence whenever you need one. Uh, and then you get a limit, which is denoted cone omega. In fact, it's cone omega of, of, the, of the building. I think you have to, you have to fix a base point in there. Um. And so uh, in Perot's paper, uh, she discusses this uh, limiting building cone omega. And, uh, and says that you have a limiting action of the group, pi 1, on the building. And uh, it turns out that you can uh, equally well get a limiting map, h omega, from the universal cover into, the, into this limiting building. And the importance for us of uh, this whole situation is that the distance between two points in the, in the building, the distance between the images of two points, is exactly what we want, which is to say, take the distance in the symmetric space between the two points, rescale by 1 over t, and then take the limit. But that's an ultra filter limit. So that's a, that means it's a limit of some subsequence, which is, uh, I think I said this. Next slide. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, that, that's the limit of some sub subsequence, which is sort of cleverly chosen, you might say. Um, now, uh, in fact, we can be a little bit more precise, because on the building, uh, so uh, let me just say, that this is a, the limiting building is a building model on the, the affine space for the SL2R, for the SLR Broatitz building, which is, which is just R to the R minus 1. Okay. Um. Yeah, but in the real life, you expect, of course, would be actual links, not the sutra filters. Yeah, so I'm going to discuss that a little bit. Uh, in fact, uh, that's a, a good point. Um, but, but for now, but let me just say this first. Um, so in fact, on the building, there's several different ways of measuring the distance. So the perhaps standard way is to measure the Euclidean metric. The, uh, let me just say, the, uh, the way to measure distance between two points in a building is that one of the axioms of a building is any two points are contained in a common apartment. An apartment is just an image of a map from here into the building. So we take our two points, we put them in a common apartment, and just measure the distance in the apartment between the two points. Now, depending on what kind of distance you put on the apartment, uh, you get a distance function on the building. The standard one is just the Euclidean distance, square root of the sum of squares of coordinates. 
that's not actually a very good choice for what we're, what we're interested in. There's a better choice, which is the Finsler distance. The Finsler distance is the log of the operator, uh, sorry, the Finsler distance is just the, the maximum of the coordinates, uh, of the variation of the coordinates. And then uh, more refined, which I'll say on the next slide, is the. Apart from you take Finsler distance. Yeah. Using the just co the wild coordinates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can actually combine these all together, the different coordinates all together, and get what's called a vector distance, uh, which basically means uh, take, take the, all the coordinates but arrange them in decreasing order. Uh, and these guys all, co all come from limits of the corresponding distances on the symmetric space. The Euclidean distance comes from the usual distance. The Fensler distance comes from the guy which is just the log of the operator arm of the matrix. And the vector distance comes from the full collection of dilation exponents between the two metrics on the symmetric space. And in fact, so what we're really interested in uh, to get kind of a full information sorry, about the WKB problem. Sorry. Is the vector distance. So in the affine space, so the R affine space is the set of points in R to the R whose sum is zero. So it's R to the R minus one. The value group. Hmm. The Val group is just the symmetric group acting by uh, permeating the coordinates. And the vector distance between the origin and a point is obtaining just by reordering the points so that they're in decreasing order. So it's vector value, mm. since it's collection of numbers. No, this distance actually vector distance satisfies right triangle inequality. It does satisfy triangle inequality. I mean, there was some mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. right? If you if you I mean you have to interpret I mean you add term by term yeah yeah. Now uh, uh, so so the vector distance it just means put our two points in a common apartment and then use the vector distance in that apartment. Now suppose uh, now what's the corresponding thing on the symmetric space? Let's just put the distance define the distance the vector distance between two different metrics to be lambda 1 up to lambda k, where basically one metric is equal to e to the lambda i times the other metric on an uh, adapted common orthonormal basis. Now, uh, somebody will probably say, but that's not a distance function or something like that. Um, uh, we're only interested in what's going on in the large. Hmm? Ah, sorry. Uh, uh, and so it's more like clap one of exponents. Yeah, it's collection. It's not one number. It's yeah, it's the exponents. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of transport matrices, matrices, the first exponent, the first distance is just the log of the, the norm of the matrix, the operator norm of the matrix. And uh, we can just use operator norms to get a hold of all of these guys because we can take the operator norm of the matrix on the kth exterior power. That will be the sum of the first k exponents. So uh, this is just to say that, that looking at this vector of guys is just basically the same as looking at the, at the operator norm of the transport matrix. So we can just basically think of the lambda 1 distance, and that's the Finsler metric. So we're only interested in these distances on the symmetric space in the large as they pass to the limit after the rescaling. And the distance, and the rescaled distance is just, for the Finsler guy, is just 1 over t times the log of the operator norm. So let's define the ultra filter exponent to be uh, the same thing as the limb soup, except the limb soup is replaced by the ultra filter limit. So that means it's the limit of some subsequence. In particular, the limit of a subsequence is going to be less than or equal to the limb soup. The ultra filter limit means we choose a, some cleverly chosen system of subsequences. Uh, and, and so that'll be less than the limb soup. And so now, uh, the question that Maxime was asking is, is this really the same as the limit? So that will be the, the case in some cases. So the first observation is that if we fix a choice of points P and Q, then we can choose some ultrafilter such that the ultrafilter limit is equal to the limb soup for that choice of P and Q. We just choose a subsequence that calculates the limb soup and then uh, subordinate the, the ultrafilter to that subsequence. 
what's not clear is whether we can really do this for all pairs of points P and Q at the same time. Uh, in the example that we're going to treat, that actually will follow a posteriori. A priori, no. A priori, no. No. Uh, well, of, cor of course, the second observation is that suppose that the limb sup is actually equal to a limit. Then, of course, it's the same as the ultra filter limit. So this is the case, for example, when we use the local WKB approximation. And uh, it would also apply in the complex WKB approximation for generic angles of the, of the for, for after we twist by a generic uh, angle, if we knew that the Laplace transform didn't have essential singularities. So that's a, so I mean, I, I, uh, I don't in general know how to prove that the Laplace transform of this guy is, doesn't have essential singularities. And if it had essential singularities, that would be like sort of having several different singularities all glued together at the same point. So it would be sort of like having a, a wall also. And then, then you might just get some kind of weird behavior. Uh, if the Laplace transform doesn't have essential singularities, and if you twist things by a generic angle so that there's only one singularity of the Laplace transform which has biggest real part, then Everything is governed by the asymptotic expansion at that real part, and the asymptotic expansion has a leading term, and so you can just see that the the, the limb soup is actually equal to a limit. So in fact, so so we pretty much expect that somehow or other we will be able to prove that that will be the case. Okay. So now uh, our main remark here is the, just the classical WKB approximation, which says the following thing. I mean, it says more than this, but uh, at least it says this, I guess. Uh, which is, suppose we have a short path in the x tilde star. That means x tilde, but not going near the, the singular point. And suppose the path is non-critical. So non-critical, that means that if we pull back to the path, the real part of the differential forms, then they're all distinct all along the path. So that means that we have a reordering of the differential forms. And up to the reordering, we can assume that the first one is bigger than the second one, and so on. In that case, the, ju that's just complex WKB theory, as, as my understanding goes. Uh, that's just, sorry, that's just classical WKB theory that's from like 1920 or something like that. Uh, and the, in that case, you can really describe the dilation exponents for the transport matrix, and that we exactly get the approximation like that. So these lambda i's are the here. Sorry, again, the notation is not quite the same as in the other talks. The lambda, I, the, the, what was called lambda i before here was, is here phi i. And here, the lambda i's are the integral of the phi i. So, so now given, um, well, let me say that uh, here this is supposed to be really a sort of a, a fairly good approximation, which is to say, uh, the, the dilation exponents uh, grow like lambda i, but not, not less, basically. And the corollary is that we have in the limit, we always have the, the, the distance in the cone omega is just equal to this family of, uh, of exponents given by the integral. Uh, and that's the statement for the complex WKB problem. Uh, I think we conjecture that the same should actually be true for the Hitchin WKB problem. Uh, so, and in fact, th uh, this was a pre this is a misconception about uh, what you guys were doing. Which is, I thought that you guys were actually claiming this statement, uh, but in fact, you guys are actually doing more of a complex WKB problem, even though it has this one over t uh, term also. But uh, it's still it's holomorphic in t. So I guess you guys aren't really claiming that, as far as I can tell. Because in, in Hitchin case, we're, we're actually solving the Hitchin equations. But, uh, but we think that that should also be true in the Hitchin case. OK, anyway, uh, corollary in the complex case, and also, of course, in the Hitchin case, if that turns out to be true, um, is that if we have any non-critical path, even, not, uh, even a long one, not necessarily a short one, then if we use the map to the building, our path is going to map everybody into a single apartment in the building. And the vector distance in the apartment is just given by the same integral. Okay. Remember, these lambda i's are 
these lambda i's are the integrals of the real part of the forms, phi i. So this is just from the classical WKB approximation. We can get sort of a fairly good control already. And the, the, the passage from short paths to long paths is, uh, as you were saying, the, the triangle inequality for the vector distance. Uh, the case of equality and triangle inequality actually tells us that if we have three points such that you have the sum relation for the vector distance, then the three points are, are all three in the same apartment. Usually in a building, any two points are contained in the same apartment but three points are not necessarily contained in the same apartment. If we have a relation like that, then they are contained in the same apartment. And in fact, they're in opposite chambers and centered at the middle point. Uh, maybe, let me just draw the thing I mentioned here. The, in, inside, an, a, a, what does an apartment look like? We have th uh, three different families of reflection hyperplanes. You know, a one, two, two, three, and one, three. Um, and the convex hull, for example, the, 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 the segment in the Finsler distance from this point to this point, for example, is something that looks like that. So, uh, so these are actually sort of the good segments to look at in the building. Uh, the actual Euclidean segment is not all that useful in, in this context. The, 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 the real segment between this point and this point is just the convex hull of these two points, but in the Finsler distance, uh, that means we go like that. That means any path that looks like that is sort of non-critical, and we'll calculate the correct Finsler distance or the vector distance. So now, uh, corollaries that in fact, this, this, this actually implies that our map from x tilde into cone omega is a harmonic phi map in the sense of Gromo shown. What does that mean? That means that any point in the complement, there's a discrete set of singular points, which could, which of course contain the singular points we all have already. They could also, in principle, contain some kind of other bad points, um, but discrete. In the complement of that set, then any point has a neighborhood which maps into a single apartment in the building. And furthermore, the map to the to the apartment is given by just integrating the one form. So I think this is uh, this is seems very similar to what Andy was saying that we have sort of local systems of, uh, of fundamental solutions on the on the sector. Um, I don't think that we can go from this statement to to what you were saying. Uh, you probably can go from what you were saying to this statement. On the other hand, um, but anyway, so okay, so this this finishes what we can say about sort of the general situation which is that we get this harmonic phi map h omega, but which depends on the choice of ultra filter. The, the, the exponent that you get using that map, namely the, dis the Finsler distance, is smaller or equal to the WKB exponent. And furthermore, we can choose the ultra filter so that that, that holds, the equality holds for at least one choice of P and Q. And also, equality holds in the local case. That's to say, when p and q are close by. Now, we actually expect that one should be able to choose a single uh, omega, which gives a building which works for all p and q, or maybe almost all p and q, or something like that. Uh, sort of the set of points, the set of bad points, uh, the set of bad values of t, which you might have ha wrongly taken in your subsequence, uh, should have sort of small enough measure that for the different points that they don't intersect too much, that they don't cover everybody too much. And this is just, so you, you start with a Higgs bundle, and from the and just or from the Higgs bundle you get this harmonic map, or does it need to? Well, yeah, um, th so what the statements I'm making here are for the case of the complex WKB. So uh, here we're taking a, a Higgs bundle and an initial connection, nab was zero, and we're looking at the case, uh, the complex WKB is the, Something like that, and so this and this harmonic map. So it depends not not only on the not only on the Higgs bundle, but also. But on in this case, H is just fixed. Right. I mean, it, it doesn't depend only on that phi there. It, it depends also on the the harmonic map that you get doesn't depend only on phi, but it also depends on uh, not but not. 
Yeah, it depends on Avalanche. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so, in, for example, uh, it might be that it has different behavior dependent for a sp special choice of NABLA or not. Uh, and then, then uh, we, we, will, we, we would uh, sort of uh, imagine that we get a better control on the exponents if we choose a generic value of NABLA or not, basically. And uh, so, so, so what I'm saying now is, is for this case, because this, in, this is the case in which we know how to do the local WKB approximation. Uh, so one could hope that, that for the actual Hitchin equations, but where we take, uh, so we're doing this case. We would hope to be able to treat the case that we take T We'd hope to be able to treat the case where we take uh, j this considered as Higgs bundle and solve the Hitchin equations for t times phi, and then uh, look at that. Or I mean, you, you guys are already talking about more general things where you let the bundle vary, the the space vary, and everything. Uh, I, I don't know what what to say about that. I mean, of course, y you hope in the abstract to to be able to have a statement for that kind of situation also. But but uh, but what we're saying in principle is for the for the complex WKB question. OK, so, so now we'd like to analyze the harmonic phi maps in terms of spectral networks. And the, the main observation is just to note that the, if we take the reflection hyperplanes in the building, so that means the, the, the hyperplanes in the building along which the different faces are joined. Okay. Those guys are just everybody that's parallel to one of these three guys in the, in the apartment, in, in the SL3 case. Now, if we pull those guys back to, to X tilde by our harmonic map, then we just get the imaginary affiliation curves, uh, which therefore include the spectral network curves. Because the reflection hyperlamp planes in an apartment, in our case, in the SLR case, are just the equations, equations xij equals constant, where xij is the difference xi minus xj. And of course, these pull back to curves in X tilde, which satisfy the equation a real part of phi ij equals zero. So these are exactly the curves that Andy was talking about. So these are the equations for spectral network curves. Of course, the spectral network curves are the special ones that you get by sort of starting out from singular points and then doing collisions and stuff like that. So, uh, so, so of course, what we're trying to do is to understand geometrically why these uh, collision type guys uh, show up. So, uh, OK, so, uh, so that, that sort of finishes what we can say in general. Uh, so then we decided to look at the original Burke Nevins Roberts example because we saw in one of you guys in the paper you said that this was the original example. Uh, uh, the, the Japanese guys referred to somebody else also, Nikishima or something like that. Uh, but we didn't check up on that yet. But anyway, uh, so uh, this is, seems to be the first example where you actually see a collision of spectral network curves. Uh, this was the, 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 pretty much the original place. So we looked at their paper. And in their paper, they don't actually have a parameterized family of equations. So the hypothesis is that they're actually setting h bar equal to 1, uh, which physicists uh, tend to seem to do. And in fact, Maxime also did. Uh, I noticed on one of your slides. <laughs> um, so if you look in their paper, but you say, OK, actually, they were setting h bar equal to 1, so we should put h bar back in. Of course, you want to put it in in a way which is homogeneous, uh, you know, going with the derivative. So, and th then we just take a, remember for us, uh, where did I write this? Uh, t is 1 over h bar. OK, so h bar is 1 over t. And uh, again, we don't care about the i's either, the square root of minus 1. So somewhat conjecturally, the, the thing they're really talking about in their paper is the family of differential equations, which looks like this, basically. Then we use the companion matrix and so on. Uh, so instead of a, a single, instead of a third order equation for one function, we transform that into a matrix equation for three functions. And you see that the you got a Higgs field, and the spectral f curve for the Higgs field is just given by the thing that you would get from the equation by replacing the derivatives by the cotangent bundle direction. So y is the coordinate on the cotangent bundle direction, x is the coordinate on our Riemann surface. 
and up to maybe a sign error or something like that, the, the spectral curve is given by the equation y cubed minus 3y plus x equals 0. Okay. Now, the problem here is I wanted to also have the other. Let's see. So. OK. Uh. Yeah, so here's just a real drawing of the spectral curve. Uh, OK. This is just the real points of the spectral curve. Here's, this is x, and that's y. Uh, the nice thing about this polynomial, I'm not sure how they found this polynomial, it has the property that if you take, so the, the, the images in x of the two branch points are plus or minus 2. And if you take the pre-images on the curve in terms of the y-coordinates of these points, you get plus or minus 1, which are the branch points, and a plus or minus 2. Uh, so if you want to do some calculations by pulling back to the spectral curve itself and using that as an equation, uh, the, the formulas are not too terrible. Uh, so th there probably are not all that many polynomials that have that property, but anyway. Let's see. But this question looks like Fourier transform of, of, of because the spectral curve projects to variable y, yeah? yeah? Yeah. So it looks like Fourier transform of some uh, exponent of some polynomial. That, that's the point of their example, that it's just, uh, they can treat it explicitly. Ah, yes. It's really uh, yes it well, they didn't say how they calculated. Hmm? They didn't say how they calculated anything in their example, but maybe that's the way they... The, the solution's yeah. explicit here, because it's Fourier transform. Yeah, okay, yeah exactly. But, you know, I, I don't think that matters too much for what we're doing, in fact. Uh, but in any case, so, so they, uh, as we'll see, how, uh, we'll see here, uh, they sort of gave an explicit description of this collision phenomenon, in fact. Okay, so the, our differentials, phi1, phi2, phi3, are all of the form yi times dx for y1, y2, y3, the three solutions of the curve. And of course, we have branch points in x, which are 2 and minus 2, as we saw from the picture. And the imaginary spectral network uh, is as in the following picture. Uh, let's see. So this is the, this is the spectral network. Uh, modulo, maybe a rotational question or something like that. But uh, so here we have the two, the two singularities minus two and two. They sprout three lines. So this is like in Andy's uh, videos, but this is just a fixed picture, extremely basic. But these two lines up here go up here and they collide at these collision point, and create and send out a collision line here. And similarly, in the other direction, we get a collision line going down here. So there's two collision points. So let's just sum up what we'll see in the picture. So the first thing is that we have two collision points which lie on the same vertical line. Now, the next thing, which we'll see in the picture in a minute, the spectral network curves divide the plane into 10 regions. There's four regions. Uh, maybe I should write, draw the picture here. Uh, let me just draw the picture as a reminder. Okay, the, there's a sort of vertical spectral network line which actually continues on the other side, and it's the same for the two curves. I mean, that's probably not a general phenomenon. Okay. And the spectral network divides everybody into, into 10 regions. Eight regions on the outside of here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then two interior regions. Okay. The interior regions will be colored yellow in our picture. So those are yeah, some yellow top here. So these are the yellow regions. So it's this guy. How are we doing for time? Ah, we're not we're not so good for time. Ah, <laughs> maybe I'll go faster here. Okay. So arguing with the local LWKB approximation, we can actually conclude that each region is mapped into a single vial sector in a single apartment of the building. And the interior square, this yellow guy, maps into a single apartment with a fold line along the caustic. 
the caustic is this is a curve like that. That's the curve where the where the differentials uh, cross over. Uh, And in doing this discussion, we just use the axioms of uh, the building, as they were discussed by Perot and these other people. So that's our yellow region. That's the image of the yellow region inside the apartment. But you can see it, it folds over itself. And the fold line is not, it's not, it's not this guy. The fold line is the caustic. So these two points actually go to the same point. Uh, So let me just, uh, so now just arguing by the general principles of maps to buildings, what we see, uh, uh, sorry, no, so there's one further piece of data, which is that it turns out in this case that the images of these two points are the same point in the building. So the two collision points go to a single uh, point in the building. And everybody goes to sectors which start from that point. Okay. So, uh, those are the different sectors. And th those guys go to, so we can make a graph of the sectors. So this is, a, this, is the, this is the actual, this is the spherical building which corresponds to the graph of the sectors. In, in a, if, you, if you have an affine building, but you have a bunch of sectors which all start from the same point, then you can just represent that as a spherical SL3 building, which is just a graph. The segments of the graph correspond to the sectors. Uh, okay, colored in the same way. And they're arranged like that. So let me just quickly finish the, so the, the, the remaining part of the argument says that, uh, says that once, if you have a configuration like this and you try to put it inside a building, then that amounts to trying to put the, the, this graph into a spherical building. A spherical building is something that's sort of covered by hexagon. And no two points are allowed to be distance more than three apart. So every time you have a segment of length four, you should, divide, you should join it together. So for example, we should add a segment at length two, joining this point to this point to, to close up this, these four into a hexagon. Pretty much any two pairs of opposite points should be joined by a segment of length two. We've already done this with the yellow guy. Uh, now when you do that, what basically happens, so uh, if we remember our, ah, sorry, so the the collision phenomena in the BNR example comes from taking a point P here and taking a point Q here. And looking at the phenomena, ah, the collision phenomena says that if we try to do the transport matrix from the point P here to the point Q here, that we can't get the exponent just by doing an integral of one of the forms along this path. You have to integrate this, you have to integrate the form like this. Uh, is that right? You have to integrate to a collision point. When you go to a collision point, you have to go like that, then like that, and then like that, basically. Okay. That amounts to doing a phi 1 here, and then phi 3 all the way over to here. You can't just do phi 1, phi 2, or phi 3 along the path. That's the collision phenomenon. And what that translates into saying here is that these two is that, sorry, that these five adjoining paths, one, two, three, four, five, cannot all be in the same apartment. Okay. That's to say, a path like this guy is not going to go into a single apartment in the building. And you can actually just see that from the axioms of a spherical building. Uh, using additionally the, the a statement that you got from the do local WKB picture, which is that as you cross over, if you look at a point, for example, here, when we go from here to here, the image of these two sectors inside the building is not supposed to fold like that. Okay. The local WKB thing tells us that in a neighborhood at this point, uh, we go into a single apartment and the, the 
map into the apartment is given by these linear forms. So we're not supposed to fold. And if you're not allowing anybody to fold along the, the octagon that you have to start, then, you're not, then you can't put those five guys into a single apartment, basically because, uh, let's see, the, maybe the, I don't know, let's see. If you, if you try to put these five guys into a single apartment, then, then uh, if we get this guy and this guy in the same apartment, then that would mean that there would be a, another sector going directly from here to here. But then we would have a path of length four. We'd have a, sorry, a cycle of length four. Okay. You're not supposed to, the building is supposed to be negatively curved, so you're not supposed to have only four sectors that join together. So, uh, let me just write that down. If, I, if we try to put these five sectors into, a, into the same apartment, these four sectors are in the same apartment. And that looks like this, actually. One, two, three, four. Okay. If we try to put the fifth sector into the same apartment, then, 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 then there has to be only a, a single remaining sector joining from here to here. Okay. But then we would have one, two, three, and then this remaining four sectors. So that can't happen in a building. And that's basically the phenomenon which forces these two guys to, to not be in the same. Uh, I, I need to stop here. So let me just finish with this drawing. This is sort of the image, this is what the image of this guy looks like. Um, that we have we have two basic apartments that are joined at a think of joining two join two sheets of paper together along something which is a union of two sectors okay. the the image of x goes into this sub piece of the building Then, let me just, uh, this is what I was all saying here. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just get to the conclusion here. The conclusion is we've got a universal building with a harmonic fee map. Uh, sorry, from x tilde into the building, uh, such that for any other guy, it factors through our universal guy. And in our example, we furthermore have the property that the factorization is not necessarily an isometry on the, on the universal building itself, but it's a isometry on the part which contains the points in x, basically. So the distances in c between points in x are the same as those in the universal building. That coupled with the, uh, remember our, that we could choose a, uh, an omega depending on p and q, which gave us the right dilation exponent. Since now we know that the, the distance is independent of the choice of omega. So now the WKB dilation exponent is calculated as the distance in the building B, this universal building B phi. So that's what we're hoping to say is the generalization in the higher rank case of the fact that in the SL2 case, uh, you can look at the tree, which is the space of leaves of the foliation, and the, in some kind of, under some genericity hypothesis, such as the spectral curve being, being smooth, um, the, the WKB exponent is equal to the distance transverse to the foliation in the space of leaves of the foliation. So the hope, uh, this is kind of only a vague hope, but the hope is that this B phi uh, we would conjecture that something like that will exist in general. We've only constructed that in this example. Uh, we'd hope that something like that would exist in general, and that that would be some kind of generalization of the space of leaves of affiliation. Uh, in our case, we're do doing SL3. The, building, the pieces of the building have dimension 2, and our Riemann surface has dimension 2. So most of our sectors actually cover their corresponding apartments, 
except, of course, this yellow one, which only covered a, a small piece of the apartment. Um, of course, in the higher rank case, the Riemann surface still only has dimension two, and we're mapping it into some higher dimension building, higher dimensional building. Uh, we don't have any idea right now what, what kind of geometric description you could give of the points of the building which are not in the image of, of the curve. So I think that's a, a main question as to, if, is there some intrinsic description of the points of the building? Uh, okay, so I'll stop here. In this cubic example, if you would do the Fourier transform, easily solve the equations, then you have to see all these phenomena just in the Fourier transform, yeah? Well, I think th th that's what they say in the paper. They give the explicit, I mean, the, uh, they give the explicit th uh, description of the solution, and you can see that, some, that there's a Stokes phenomena along this line. Which would become a phenomenon of the actual integration. Yeah. yeah. Because it's just the Fourier I mean, integral yeah, yeah. of with the simple. So right. So so we're uh, we're trying to say that this Stokes phenomenon on the collision line uh, sort of has to come about because of the fact that we're mapping into a building, basically. Uh. I didn't understand something that in standard co complex WQV theory you never have to worry about taking the limit along an ultra filter. So what what is the complication you have? Uh, where does it come from that you have to, to worry about that? Well, for one thing, um, we were just applying this totally general theory for what happens when you take the limit of some, some symmetric space, maps into symmetric spaces, where we don't necessarily know anything about that. Um, so for that general theory, you need to use the ultra filter. Then you can say, how does that apply in our case? Um, in our case, uh, the... The, the, WK, the, the, the function is going to look something like, you know, maybe e to the a1 t plus e to the a2 t or something like that, right? If the real part of a1 and the real part of a2 are the same, then this might look like something like e to the i t plus e to the minus i t, which is just cosine of t or something like that. This, this function is equal to zero for a sequence of points going to infinity. So if our ultra filter sort of had the wrong choice and we chose the points where cosine of t equals zero, then we would get zero rather than one. I mean, that wouldn't be so good. Even that doesn't need an ultra, fi ultra filter. is right. extraordinarily elaborate. Uh, right. So here you would say, okay, let's just choose, you know, uh, 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 some points which are kind of generically chosen so that uh, the the you know cosine of something or other is approximately usually equal to a half or something like that. Um, the problem is that I, I, I mean, I, I don't, may, maybe you guys know how to do this, but I don't know how to prove that the Laplace transform doesn't have an essential singularity. If you have an essential singularity, it's kind of like adding up a whole bunch of terms like this, infinitesimally close to each other. So uh, I, I, don't, I think you probably have no control whatsoever on what the function uh, looks like, how many zeros there are of the function. So I think you could hope to try to say that sort of the, the places where the function goes to zero are, are sort of too small, kind of have smaller and smaller measure and then try to argue that way or something like that, or try to prove that this Laplace transform doesn't have essential singularity. But uh, we, we don't know that. But, so, excuse me, so two questions, if, if I may. So is this theory, about what you have presented, is it about uh, the uh, Stokes lines, or is it actually about the solutions of the differential equation? So uh, because, does it actually prove that there is a Stokes phenomenon uh, you know, I, um, study the. Uh, it's only going to It's only going to tell us what's. Ha uh, it's only going to tell us something about the exponent, which is the limb soup of the size of the, of the matrix. At least uh, uh, as it's currently done here. I mean, uh, uh, of course, you would hope that, that maybe some uh, some generalization or something like that might really give you the exact uh, solutions, or in some way or something. But I mean, I, I don't see how to do something like that. I mean, a priori, we're just talking about you know. What's the biggest? Uh, what's the biggest exponent here? Um, I don't know if that answers the question. So, uh, so you know, we're saying that you can get, uh, that you can write down the the vector of dilation exponents. Uh, we're not saying anything, for example, about what type of uh, 
what type of properties that the bases, the diagonalizing bases would have. Or right. second question in preference. But do you imagine that there should be something like this also for, like suppose I want the second exponent. Uh, okay. uh, maybe this question. The, you mean lambda 2? Uh, no, I mean, uh, no, we're claiming that this is true for the vector distance, in fact. No, yeah, I think I didn't. But that's just because, I mean, you can think of that as just saying, well, let's just take the exterior powers of our, the vector distance is given by looking at the exterior powers of our original system and just looking at the, at the operator norm. Um, but, uh, I, and I but I think this is explicitly stated in Perot's paper that, that the vector distance on the symmetric space maps to the vector distance in the limiting building. Uh, 